Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. Is bar Manali chalte hain? Nahi nahi. Goa. We Indians disagree on everything. But we agree, SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI से tractor loan लिया, बाजी ये hundred percent सही किया. SBI is the banker to every Indian. Last year, the pandemic forced the Academy to take a serious note of movies that made their debut on streaming platforms. And this year, streamers achieved another feat by scooping the best movie award, apart from over thirty-five nomination. But back home in India, OTT's future is clearly linked to vernacular programs and films. Our next report tells us why. Coda, released by Apple TV Plus, is a heartwarming film about a deaf family and their daughter who pursues passion for music. She is the only one who can hear and talk. After winning favor with audiences, it won the Best Picture Oscar. This was the first instance of a streaming service receiving the film industry's highest honor. Coda knocked out Netflix's The Power of the Dog and submissions by other traditional Hollywood studios to win this award. Its success at the Oscars has also introduced the tech giant as a serious Hollywood player. However, even before Coda went on to win big, the likes of the Wall Street Journal had already declared that the real competition at the Oscars was between Apple and Netflix. The performance of over-the-top or OTT platforms in the past year's Oscars justifies this statement. At the 2021 Oscars, Netflix snatched seven Oscars from five films. Meanwhile, Amazon Prime Video bagged another two. With that, a new record was set for streaming platform films winning it big. In fact, with 47 combined nominations, OTT dominated the nominations at Oscars 2021. The year before that, the same number stood at 25. But what does a win at the Oscars mean for streaming platforms? Looking at the case of Apple TV Plus can provide an answer. As the Wall Street Journal explains, streamers have attached an outsized importance to the Oscars as they want to be taken seriously in the movie business. The Oscars recognition will bolster awareness for Apple TV Plus as it competes for subscribers with Netflix and Disney. Furthermore, being in the contention for and winning major awards could convince producers that the likes of an Apple TV Plus are an appropriate platform for high-profile television shows and films. In short, it lends prestige, provides visibility, and attracts bigger filmmakers. All of this comes at a time when the global OTT market has received a considerable boost thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing affordable data and mobile revolution taking place in parts of the world. The industry has also seen a rapid rise in India during the same period. So we must fundamentally understand that there is no difference in whether it's an OTT or a movie that's been, you know, put for just for TV or it's a whatever format it's in, because ultimately it's entertainment that's getting viewed. That's the first and primary thing, and therefore the fact that it's a part of the award system is a very positive thing because it recognizes all formats. This is the format that is an additional format that's come in, and you'll find find much more. So you are witnessing a change, which means there is a. There's going to be a fundamental change in the fact that there's a new format, but the fact that this will change the way that movies are awarded may not happen. It will still continue to be on the same creative lines that it used to be betted on. Theaters hate a movie just being launched in OTT because yeah. they are losing yeah. revenue and they are almost afraid. And the connection between theaters and Oscars have been so close because for decades they've only been launched in theaters, so there's an exclusivity kind of arrangement that is there. <clears throat> but When you say OTT or not OTT, suppose it's a movie made for TV alone, would it not get nominated? And by that, you're only excluding. So Oscars have to be inclusive. I don't think there can ever be a situation where you must have a criteria like this. But will this big Oscar win affect OTT's Indian viewership in any way? The answer seems to be no. A recent Fiki EY report says 
that the share of regional languages in overall OTT video content will double from 27% in 2020 to 54% in 2024. In 2021, 47% of OTT originals and 69% of films released on platforms were not in Hindi. According to a report by the Confederation of Indian Industry and Boston Consulting Group, OTT services and gaming are now driving the growth in India's media and entertainment industry, helping it grow 12 to 16 percent year on year in 2021 to a market size of $27 billion. At present, OTT accounts for a 7 to 9 percent market share in the $27 billion Indian M&E industry. By 2030, its market share is expected to rise to 22 to 25 percent. At the same time, television's market share is set to fall from around 35% to 24%. The growth in subscription-based OTT services comes on the back of improved internet and smartphone penetration and payment mechanisms. Pricing innovations are another driving factor. For example, Netflix has been offering its India plans at affordable prices, compared to the prices it charges in other geographies. According to the CII BCG report, the Indian pricing plans of global streaming giants are, on average, 70 to 90 percent cheaper than their prices for the US market. Meanwhile, local OTT players have also entered the fray, driving a reduction in prices for such services. However, the picture is not rosy for all players. Netflix, for example, has not been able to crack the Indian market. Netflix was launched in India in January 2016. As of January this year, it was a distant third in the country. While the company doesn't reveal how many subscribers it has, one research firm has claimed that it has around 5.5 million Indian subscribers. Meanwhile, the research firm has said that Amazon Prime and Hotstar, Netflix's primary competitors, are far ahead with 22 million and 46 million subscribers, respectively. The only way forward, it seems, is more local content. Woot, Sony Live and Disney Plus Hotstar are also acquiring films in the four southern languages besides Marathi and Punjabi. All the streaming platforms are trying to increase the viewership and looking beyond metros. And the key to expansion in Tier 2 and Tier 3 towns is quality content in local languages. सब अच्छी दिख रही हैं यार कौन सी खरीदूं ये तो वही बात हुई 4000 शेयर्स लिस्टेड है कौन सा लूं वो तो सबसे आसान है तुझे 5 पैसा नहीं पता अब तो सबको पता है 5 पैसा पर है 4000 स्टॉक्स की रिसर्च टेक्निकल टूल्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज डाउनलोड 5 पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद 5 पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट्स इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग OTT's future in India indeed depends on its capability to churn out good programs in local languages. Let us now move on to Baroda PNB Baribar Mutual Fund created recently by the merger of Baroda Mutual Fund and BNP Paribar Mutual Fund. Its CEO Suresh Soni spoke to Business Standards Krishna Veera Vanamali on the markets, the mutual fund industry and what the merged entity stands for. Good morning, sir, and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. Good morning. Firstly, can you give us your outlook for the markets currently? How long do you think the volatility may continue? And do you think the Indian markets are still overvalued? We had seen a sustained rise in equity market from COVID lows in early April till about October last year. And from there on, we have been moving sideways. Over the last few months, we have seen the um, FI outflows of about $30 billion. In fact, this time around, we indeed had an episode of geopolitical risk. So we have had to contain with that. We had to have contain with higher commodity prices. We had to contain with Fed rate hike. But despite that, I would admit that the markets have held relatively well. Lately, we have seen some kind of a tapering off in FI outflows. And if it stabilizes at some point of time, hopefully, we should have lower volatility in the market. Apart from market, let's look at where the economy is. And on that side, India seems to be in a good place. On a valuation perspective, given the last six months, markets have not gone anywhere. Valuations have become slightly better. They are now at average of the last five years. So if you are earning out 
from a medium term perspective seems decent to so near term in the next few months given the geopolitical risk that you see high commodity prices that you see there could be a little bit of sideways movement so the merger has come into effect after more than 2 years so what do you see as the strengths of this merged entity and what vision or goals do you have for it what this merger merger does is brings along the strength of two large institutions which are backing it so on one hand you have bank of baroda which is a large national bank very good understanding of retail market very large network as well as a very well recognized brand in india on the other hand you have bnp paribas asset management which is one of the global leaders and certainly a leader in europe in asset management uh, their processes their risk management processes their investment processes all of that so what you bring together is the strength of two organizations which are very complementary so this is in a way a reset point in the life of uh, the asset management company and we should be looking to grow significantly from post merger what does your new product pipeline look like uh, which category or sub category where are you seeing opportunities ahead so in terms of the product pipeline as we merge our existing product pipeline becomes stronger so as of today we have 28 schemes across equity fixed income and hybrid category there are a few product gaps that we have in our portfolio and that's something that we would look to bridge over a period of next 6 to 12 months but inflows into index funds were almost 5000 crore in january a new record uh, although it's very minuscule of the total asset management industry so are you planning to enter the space or are you leaving that to other players and focus on just your active schemes interesting questions and i think passive market has actually seen disproportionate growth i am very frankly this 5000 crore number last month mm-hmm. is not a stand alone we have seen a huge trend in favor of passive over the last few years that's an area that we are watching with interest mm-hmm. we are at this point of time primarily an active manager and we do believe our fund managers create alpha in active funds having said that given the fact that we are seeing a lot of interest and interest coming in the passive that's an area that we are watching with interest and we would certainly be looking at it over a period of time post this merger would you consider yourself as a new uh, mutual fund company number one and second so several other new players are entering the space some examples are uh, navi uh, zeroda capital mind etc so is there scope for everyone to grow in this asset management industry in india and how do you plan to compete against both incumbents as well as the new players so as we come together i think what differentiates us from some of the other names that you took is the fact that we are backed by very solid institutions with a very strong long term legacy so bank of baroda has been around in india now for more than 110 years similarly bnp paribas bank has been around in india for more than 160 years so that gives us very strong solidity on day one having said that we are a new entity and in that sense we would have the energy of a startup because as baroda bnp mutual fund we have taken birth only on 14th of march so we would have an energy of startup but at the same time solidity of two strong financial powerhouses behind us it i think uh, mutual funds all said and done are yet very under penetrated income tax pan holders in india are close to 50 crores against that the number of total investors unique investors in mutual fund would be between 2 and 1/2 to 3 crores so we are yet very very under penetrated mutual funds are owned by less than 2% of population of this country 98% have not yet invested so in terms of the scope for growth for the market is huge there is scope for everybody to grow in this market market will accommodate a lot more players you need to be nimble footed to be able to reach out to the investors and win their trust i also want to ask do you foresee further uh, you know consolidations in this industry i think that's a trend that we have seen over a period of time see this is a business of scale at the end of the day with the same investment team you could manage a larger pool of assets because at the end of the day you are allocating money across different stocks and different sectors so to that extent this is an industry which lends itself well for consolidation as well as growth so that's an area that i would see would see continued action in india you know there are times when the industry goes through a tough phase and then there is a consolidation which is forced because however in the current environment i would think these will be more growth acquisitions that you would probably see in the industry as well as entry of new player as you are already witnessing uh thank you sir that's all the uh, questions i had wonderful great yeah. talking to you krishna thank you so very much yaar mat puch yaar फिर से स्टॉक्स में फंस गया तो स्टॉक्स के साथ बॉन्ड्स इंश्योरेंस गोल्ड में बैलेंस कर इसमें बहुत तामचाम है तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता
अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा है ऑल इन वन अकाउंट डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है Investing made easy and rewarding with Five Paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. Not just the mutual funds this financial year was exceptionally good for markets too. Fifty-two Indian companies raised an all-time high of one point one trillion rupees through initial public offers or IPOs. and the next fiscal year may well break this record too the government plans to launch the mega ipo of life insurance corporation or lic soon our next report does a quick check on what's in store for the primary markets in fy23 2021 has been an impressive year for the indian primary markets with highest ever fundraising in a calendar year and the momentum could well continue in FY23 according to a note by prime database 54 companies plan to raise a massive 1.4 trillion rupees in the upcoming fiscal year including the much awaited LIC IPO these 54 companies already have market regulator securities and exchange board of india's approval for raising the money another 43 companies the note said are looking to raise about 81000 crore rupees where sebi approval is still awaited the amount raised in fy22 according to pranav haldia managing director prime database group was over 3.5 times 31268 crore rupees raised through 30 IPOs in 2020-21. The previous best year was financial year 2017-18 when 81,553 crore rupees was raised. According to Haldia, IPOs from new age loss making tech startups, strong retail participation and listing gains were the other key highlights of 2021-22. But public equity fund raising dropped to 1.70 trillion rupees from 1.9 trillion rupees in the preceding year. The largest IPO in 2021-22, which was also the largest Indian IPO ever, was of 197 Communications for 18,300 crore rupees. Some of the other prominent ones included Zomato, Star Health, PB FinTech, Sona BLW, and FSN. e-commerce the parent company of Nike and retail investors were a force to reckon with the average number of applications from the retail category was 14.05 lakh the prime database report said in comparison to 12.73 lakh in 2020-21 and 6.88 lakh in 2019-20 The highest number of applications from retail in 2021-22 was for Glenmark Life Sciences, Devyani International and Latent View. Going ahead, analysts expect the secondary market to remain choppy due to the geopolitical crisis between Russia and Ukraine. This they feel will have repercussions for the primary market activity as well. G. Chokalingam, founder and chief investment officer at Economics Research, for instance, expects the Sensex to remain in the range of 56,000 to 57,000 till a solution is found for the Ukraine-Russia war. Here's how he sees the primary and the secondary markets play out in the next fiscal. It will be better than what we are seeing in uh, the last quarter of FY22 for both primary market and secondary market because as you know unprecedented level of FY selling came still the market is down only 7% if you take sensex or if you take overall market cap it is down just about 8% So this is also unprecedented despite uh, such a massive FY selling the market has not crashed But FY23 would be different. That's because 23 GDP growth of India, most uh, institutions say it would be around 8 percent, which would be still one of the fastest uh, growth rates across the world. And secondly, the massive structural change in terms of retail investors pouring in. Even last week, more than 5 lakh investors have come into the market. So there is no drop in the number of investors coming in. So they would give su- solid support to small cap, mid cap in FY23. and uh, that is why both secondary market and primary market would be good in fy23 because most of the ipos are largely from yeah, some uh, small and mid cap space so that is where the focus of the new investors so i remain quite optimistic on the war front also i believe uh, it's getting exhausted for uh, both ukraine and russia 
neither of them is gaining from this war and more pain for russia on economic front so somewhere in uh, four to five weeks i see some compromise uh, being formed अब क्या किया शेयर्स में ट्रेडिंग तुम्हें फाइल पैसा नहीं पता ओए, अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर मिलते हैं रिसर्च टूल्स पोर्टफोलियो एनालिटिक्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज भी डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुल बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग it's not just the stock exchanges but companies listed there people organizations the government departments etc which are always on the guard against malwares and of the lot ransomware is among the most notorious through this hackers take control of all the data in the system and release it at a price watch our next report to know more about this growing menace The world has been embroiled in a different kind of battle for decades now. There is no exchange of shots here and there is no bloodshed either. But what people, private entities and government organizations lose if they slip is no less than their blood. It is their hard-earned money and the reputation that is at stake. It is a virtual world and most of the inhabitants here are up against scary malwares. and for the creators of these bugs ransomware is most lucrative according to research from unit 42 by palo alto networks the global cyber security leader ransomware payments hit new records in 2021 india saw 218% rise in ransomware attacks in 2021 The 2022 Unit 42 ransomware threat report has revealed that India ranks 10th globally when it comes to the number of ransomware attacks. More worrisome is the fact that it ranks second in the Japan and Asia Pacific region. But what happens when your system falls prey to ransomware? It is scary. The hackers hold your files and data, including sensitive information, hostage until you pay up. Basically, ransomware is a type of malware that prevents you from accessing your personal files or system. In simple terms, your critical data gets encrypted so that you cannot access files, applications and databases. As McAfee explains, ransomware involves the use of asymmetric encryption. A pair of keys is used to encrypt and decrypt the files or data targeted. Then it demands that you pay a ransom in order to regain access. Once it enters your system, the ransomware searches and encrypts valuable files. Everything from Microsoft Word documents, databases and images are compromised. The ransomware can also take advantage of network vulnerabilities to spread to other systems. It can even spread across entire organizations. The attacker generates a unique public private pair of keys for the victim. The private key needed to decrypt the files is stored on the attacker's server. After the ransom is paid, the attacker provides the private key to the victim. It is almost impossible to decrypt the files or data that are being held hostage without access to the private key. After the files have been encrypted, the ransomware demands that the victim pay up a ransom within 24 to 48 hours to decrypt them. If they don't, the targeted files will be lost forever. How does ransomware enter your system in the first place? According to Kaspersky, the most common infection routes for ransomware are visiting malicious websites, unwanted add-ons during downloads, and downloading malicious attachments. So, how do you defend against ransomware? According to McAfee, you should back up your data, secure your backups, use security software, keep your security software up to date, practice safe surfing and only use secure networks. Isko 30 degrees kar dete hain. Are nahi yaar 45 degree sahi hai. We Indians disagree on everything, but we agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI ka video KYC savings account. Finally I agree. 
SBI is the banker to every Indian. Last year, an insurer paid a whopping $40 million as ransom to regain control of its systems. It is arguably the largest ransomware payment to date. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, log on to businessstandard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.